It is a glorious day to worship God and to give thanks and praise to God. So let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. stand for the call to worship. Bless God at all times. We will bless and thank God at this morning service of worship. Bless God at all times. We will bless God when we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, the markers of our human life. Bless God at all times. Bless God when God holds us fast in the storms of life. Bless God at all times. Bless God when we have been blessed with joy within our family or friendship circle. Bless God at all times. We will bless God when evil is confronted and discouraged given hope. We will bless God at all times.
join me in the prayer of confession. God of peace, we have rejected your redemption and forged our own way. We hang between heaven and earth, caught up in our own folly. We have held fast to falsehood, deceiving others and ourselves. We have sinned against you and done violence to others. Bitterness and wrath, anger and wrangling, slander and malice consume us. Evil runs rampant in our hearts. If you, O Lord, should mark our inequities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. Our soul waits in hope for your word to redeem us, so that we may begin anew, a new day with you. Amen. the assurance of God's forgiving grace. Sisters and brothers, do not lose heart. When we, forget, when we confess, God forgives us. We believe and so we proclaim. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us share the signs of peace. Please be seated. Join me in the prayer for illumination. O oh God, by your spirit, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do. Amen. The first scripture lesson is from 2 Samuel 18, 5 through 9, 15, and 31 through 33. The king ordered Joab and Abishai and Iti, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than by the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule was under him went on. And ten young men Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for the Lord, the king, for the Lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, It is well with the young man, Absalom? The Cushite answered, 
May the enemies of the Lord the King and all who rise up do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And from Psalm 130, 1 through 8, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark inequities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its inequities. And from John 6, 35, 41 through 44, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up to the last day. Word of the Lord. I've imagined, I've pondered in my heart, and I've prayed how to present today's text to you. While engaged in my angst and hair pulling contemplation of the biblical message, I realized that. I might want to select another lectionary reading and avoid all the blushing and the stammering and all the talk about incest, murder, parental abuse, sex in public, and the like. Sure, there are safer stories. We could go with the gospel reading, for one. They are the ones that we have those real cozy picture books, you know, with the flannel that you can take out and you can put on the, the board like we used to have in Sunday school. There we don't see sexual violence, graphic death, or wailing, or weeping. Our modern sensibilities are constantly making excuses for the Bible, trying to clean it up, make it more presentable, to a culture that purchases bloodless chicken parts at Kroger and then goes home and spends an evening streaming gore and violence on Netflix. We don't like messes. And if we have to have them, we want them well contained. But as we all know, life is messy. And the Bible is messy. We try to cover up language that makes us feel uncomfortable. We ignore, apologize for, even cut out and disregard much of Scripture. We would publish only the parts that we like, except that we'd be left with something so brief that we 
we could tweet it. But we need to see ourselves among the plotting, murdering, blaspheming people of God and pay attention to what God makes of the mess. And I hope and pray that God will make something out of our mess today. Most of us can't handle this material in our private readings, but it's more difficult in corporate worship. And what if we had young children? But we need to press on with these uncomfortable stories because, because, my friends, the radical grace of God is found within them. We sin. God forgives. But there are consequences for our sins. And with grace, these consequences will turn us back and transform us from God's grace. So let's crack open the Bible again, and let's sleep right back in to the next installment of the days of the lives of David. Last time we met David, he had admitted to doing evil in the eyes of God. And what was that evil? He seduced his sergeant's wife, he plotted that man's death, and he had a child by that union. Then we had Nathan. Remember Nathan? The truth-telling, just-say-no prophet in David's court. He warned David, and pay attention, that the consequences of David's sin would come from inside David's own family. What you did, you did secretly, proclaimed Nathan to David. But what God will do, God will do before all of Israel. There's no doubt that David is a complicated and contradictory character. He's ambitious, he's cunning, he's aggressive, and he's very sure of himself. He demonstrates that leadership is a complex multifaceted skill involving management and vision, but it also has the capacity to engage the imaginations of those to be led. While King Saul's violence was undisciplined and quite paranoid, King David's violence is shrewd and calculating in the service of his bold self indulgence. And remember when we started this series way back when, the prophets before Nathan had warned Israel when it started whining for a king. Kings, they cautioned, are dangerous. Even a king as golden as David. Kings give in to the temptation of their own power, and eventually they overstep. They take what doesn't belong to them, and sure enough, that's what David did. And who has been watching the king during all of these shenanigans? Who's been watching? His offspring. Children are always watching their parents, their grandparents, their aunt and uncles. They learn from our actions. And David's sons were watching. Abnon, the firstborn and next in line to the throne. And Absalom, the third son, by another mother. And David's daughter, Tamar, is watching too. Tamar is Absalom's sister and Amnon's half-sister. They all know what happened. Daddy wanted and took because he could, and he got away with it. And we might as well cue the ominous music 
for there's a predatory precedence on the loose now. And the ones who are the most susceptible and vulnerable to it are David's family. So, like father, like son. And this is the part of the lectionary that we didn't read this morning. It comes before what we read. Amnon falls in lust with his half-sister Tamar. Amnon was stronger, and so he forced Tamar to have sex with him. He wanted and he took because he could. David's precedent has struck another member of the family. Tamar's brother, Absalom, advises Tamar to be quiet for now, speaking neither good nor bad to his brother, Amnon. Now, at this point, we aren't sure whether he's biding his time to make a play for the throne or truly sickened by his half-brother's actions. But we do know there's nothing between these two brothers but hate. Doubtless, Absalom expected his father, the king, to avenge the wicked act. But David, David didn't do anything. And perhaps that was due to his own weakness in the area of fleshy desire or his tempestuous relationship with Absalom. But Absalom would not be denied justice. And so at the end of two years, 24 months, seething all the while, he laid a plot and had Amnon killed. Like father, like son. And as a result of the assassination, Absalom was forced to flee beyond the Jordan for asylum. In three years, 36 months, he was in exile. And the scripture tells us, David mourned for his son every single day. Finally, Absalom was allowed to return to Jerusalem, but even then he was not permitted into his father's presence for another two years, another 24 months. From the outset of his return, <laughs> the ungrateful lad began to make plans to wrest his father's throne from him. Does that sound familiar? But kingdoms don't always topple overnight, and so the rebel son stealthily, as the scripture says, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So Absalom, with a strong military force, declared himself to be the king. So we have two kings again. Remember when we had two kings before? And as prophesied by Nathan, Absalom gathered all of David's women on the roof of the royal palace in order to sleep with them in full view of those in the city. What you did, you did secretly, but what I shall do, I shall do before all of Israel. Remember God said that? David fled from the capital city, weeping as he climbed the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem. The wise commander soon gathered his wits, though, and made plans to put down the insurrection. And eventually, the forces of David and those of Absalom would meet in mortal conflict in the forest east of Jordan. Now, the scripture reflects a tender note and that the king specifically charged his captains, deal gently for my sake with the young men and especially with my son Absalom. But his command was to be ignored. 
And as Absalom rode through that dense forest, he caught his long flowing hair in some low branches of a great oak tree, and his mule ran out from under him. And Joab, remember Joab? Joab, David's commander and some of his soldiers, came upon Absalom in those unfortunate circumstances. They did not cut him down from the tree, but they beat him mercilessly as he helplessly hung there, as the scripture says, between heaven and earth. And when David heard of the death of his beloved son, he uttered one of the most plaintive cries recorded in the Bible. Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died for you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And that's where the story ends a terminus of ruins. And we're left wondering, at least I'm wondering, what might have gone differently if David had punished Ammon or if Absalom had spoken up. Perhaps a measure of integrity would have been restored to the kingdom with justice for Tamar. It would have required deeply painful speech and action, much harder than David's atonement for his sins made to Nathan a couple of chapters ago. Because now we're talking about the atonement of an entire family. But it could have happened, but it didn't. And now, just a few chapters later, these boys of David's are dead and his beautiful daughter has disappeared. What are we to make of this? I think a couple of things. The pain that David must endure is nothing other than the logical consequence of what he has done. And by submitting to this terrible moment, David allows himself to be refashioned in the image of the God he longs to serve. Fleeing the city and humiliated by his adversaries, David puts his future solely in the hands of God. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, David confesses, God will bring me back. Put simply, not my will, Lord, but thine. It's widely assumed that forgiveness in the Bible is a yes or no proposition, right? One is either forgiven are not forgiven. End of question. In certain Protestant circles, this is often associated with what is known as the forensic theory of atonement. And no, there will not be a multiple choice question there after worship, so don't worry. On this view, the forensic theory of atonement, forgiveness is likened to a judge, to Rick, Declaring an accused party innocent. The legal declaration depends not on the spiritual constitution of the forgiven, but on the authority of the judge. This view is at considerable variance for what most of us Christians, including those of us who are in the Reformed tradition, who emphasize the process of sanctification. Forgiveness in this context isn't so much forensic declaration as a process. It's not a declaration, it's a process. It begins at baptism with the infusion of justifying grace, but the 
process continues toward complete transformation of the individual. It is not, in any sense of the word, a simple yes or no proposition. It is not the cheap grace that Dietrich Bonhoeffer worried about. For someone committed to a cheap grace understanding of forgiveness, the story of David's penance will remain an enigma. For according to this theory, once David pronounced the words of absolution, the matter should have been closed. God acted, human deeds can no longer be, have material contribution to the process, but for those of us, for those of us who are beholden to a robust doctrine of sanctification, every detail in this story about David can be and should be pondered and savored. Yes, David is forgiven. But he must make the journey through the muck and the mire of the consequences of his actions and inactions on that winding road of transformation into the person God has created him to be. And the glorious, beautiful, most amazing amazing thing is this. God makes the journey with David. I will not take my steadfast love from David, says God. I won't take my steadfast love from this imperfect person who's made terrible decisions, who's remained silent when he should have acted, who acted when he should have done nothing. Like David, and this is why I love these stories, like David, each one of us has far to travel in becoming who God created us to be, far to journey through the consequences of missteps, mishaps, and blatant sinning. If you could see the journey whole, writes Jan Richardson in her poem, For Those Who Have Far to Travel, you might never undertake it. You might never dare the first step that propels you from the place you have known toward the place you know not. Call it one of the mercies of the road, that we see it only in stages as it opens before us, as it comes into our keeping, step by single step. Richardson says, there is nothing for it but to go. And by our going, take the vows the pilgrim takes to be faithful to the next step to rely on more than the map, to heed the signposts of intuition and dream, to follow the star that only you will recognize, to keep an open eye for the wonders that attend the path, to press on beyond distractions, beyond fatigue, beyond what would tempt you from the way. There are vows that only you will know. The secret promises for your particular path and the new ones you will need to make when the road is revealed by turns you could not have foreseen. Keep them, break them, make them again. Each promise becomes part of the path. Each choice creates the road that will take you to the place where at last you will kneel to offer the gift most needed, the gift that only you can give before turning to go home by another way. Thanks be to God. For God forgives us 
God showers us with unmerited grace, for God walks with us as we wrap our life in the warm mantle of grace that guides us in our journey through the consequences of falling short of God's plan for us. For God is our true destination, our final resting place, our ultimate home. And thanks be to God, the God of David, the God of you, the God of me. For God walks with us and will never stop loving us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Please join me in the responsive prayers of intercession and the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. God of tears, you are the giver of joy. Hear us as we pray for the sick. We pray for those with chronic illness for those who have life-threatening conditions, and for those with inadequate medical care. Bring the healing we need. Hear us as we pray for all who are hungry. We pray for those who live in regions of drought and famine, for those who cannot afford nutritious food, and for the vulnerable who are not adequately fed. Give us the food we need. Hear us as we pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who mourn a loved one, for those whose communities are no more, and for those who cannot imagine a joyful future. Give us comfort to restore hope. Hear us as we pray for the world's victims, We pray for those who are caught in violence, for those who are trapped in others' self-seeking, and for those who suffer from neglect. Grant us freedom from all evil. God of the poor and the poor in spirit, we pray for your help against all that oppresses as we look forward to the kingdom you have promised and are bringing even now through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a number of announcements this morning. If you look on the inside of your worship bulletin, you'll see the calendar for the upcoming week. I also want to bring to your attention uh, that our beautiful cards are for sale down in Westminster. I also want to remind you that this Saturday at 6.30 p.m., the Nostalgics, which is a big band um, uh, group, they play uh, big band music, um, will be uh, over at the Bowen House at 6.30 and uh, we are going to have hot dogs with coney sauce. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm looking forward to trying some of that. And uh, root beer floats. What are they called? Brown, brown cows? Uh, but we'll also have root beer floats. Um, so that will be exciting. And don't worry, if it rains... Hopefully it won't, um, but if it does, the concert will be in here and uh, the refreshments will be in Westminster. Um, and be sure and check the calendar uh, for uh, opportunities to engage in fellowship and to serve. We come each Sunday to give thanks and praise to God. We also come each Sunday to show our gratitude to God. Let us give our tithes and offerings with a grateful and generous spirit. Let us pray. Generous, transforming God, thank you for the blessing of honest labor through which you have provided these gifts for our hands to share with those in need. We dedicate them now as an expression of your love for the world. Through Christ our Lord, amen.
So depart now in the fellowship of God the Father Almighty, and as you go, remember, by the goodness of God, you were born into this world. And by the grace of God, you have been kept all the day long, even until this very moment. And by the love of God, fully revealed in the face of Jesus Christ, you are being redeemed. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.